Ah, having a seat on the Sloan throne, man. Well, it's hot here in Alice. Man, it's hot. Look, I usually don't drink soda. But as they say in South Africa, cool drink. This is uh, definitely something from Coca-Cola. This is Stony. Stony's the well, Stony, Stony, Stony. And they actually use it to, <laughs> they use it for a headache remedy. They put like grandpa or whatever, they put some with some, some uh, aspirin kind of stuff that dissolves. It cures headaches. So it's a medicine. Mm. Must be the fizz. I don't do a lot of carbonated stuff anyway. Anyway, but it's I even got ice in here. I usually don't do ice either. Well, there you go. Look, this might be a little bit long. Go ahead. I decided. Here's the thing. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be in the States in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I really didn't want to post a lot here in South Africa. But, uh, and just wait there. But uh, this this Bloomberg thing has brought something to mind. Well, brought a lot of things to mind. So I even, I even made some notes. And it, I guess it's... Uh, the, the title of the notes is The Scam. <laughs> so let me start. I don't need these. Uh, so let me, it's, just, it's a bit about my history and understanding finance or understanding whatever, whatever's going on out here. Uh, an economic shot. Okay, so you have to understand, first of all, start from the beginning, I'm not a materialistic person. When I, I actually mean I'm not a materialistic person, I had good fortune um, in my family that my sister... Her younger sister, she basically inherited all the materialistic genes, so that's what she's into. You know? Me, I'm the autistic guy, semi-intellectual. Mm. Uh, my older brother, we just found after what it is, he's like a survivor. He's like, a, he's just a survivor. He's a vagabond survivor. That's anyway. But these other people, my family, but they'll pass. Um, so let me start. Uh, a job that I had when I got out of uh, undergrad school first time, but the mid-70s, it was a, a, a job delivering newspapers. Uh, and I actually loved it. It's one of my favorite jobs. You have to understand, I'm a morning person. I wake up at 4.30 anyway. So back then, you had to wake up at 4.30, got in my car, you know, went to the place to get the newspapers, and then you delivered them. Now, when I first started, it took me like three hours, something like that, to deliver them. But when I, well, after you go, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I mean, just, this is in, in the East Brunswick area, so rich people. And so, well, mostly upper, up, upper middle class, you know, lower, lower, whatever, lower upper class people. Um, but you get really good at flaying the papers and landing in the right spot and all that sort of stuff. And I just like getting up in the morning. Anyway, uh, and the papers I would deliver was um, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Daily News, uh, Village Voice, and uh, there was another paper came every once in a while. I forgot what it was. Anyway. So I got so good that I had a lot of time at the end. Sometimes I have one or two papers at the end, so I had a lot of time. I was sitting to maybe read the paper. And I used to like reading the Wall Street Journal at that time. This is when the Wall Street Journal was really the Wall Street Journal. You know, we had the long articles. I mean, the jump page, you jump to another page, you got to jump to another page, and the whole page, is the, you know, like that. But what I found, and then, you know, I read the Times, and then I read the Daily News, and those words. Um, but what I noticed is that if something was reported in um, uh, the Wall Street Journal on Monday, right, on a Monday, say like that, on Thursday, the same story would be reported, but it would be, uh, for lack of a, uh, sort of a dumbed down, right? And then on Friday, the same story would appear, well, the story would appear in the Daily News, and it would really be dumbed down, you know, because Daily News is like a tabloid. Um, and then... Uh, well, the Village Voice always did the best for anything because it was a weekly. And in fact, uh, it was a weekly. So if, if a story came out of the Village Voice, they basically it was better researched, if you want to say it that way. Uh, and of course, uh, Wall Street Journal was researched a lot too. Anyway, so that's when I first started, got aware of some sort of thing. But even before then, in this television in the late 60s, they started to report like the Dow Jones Industrial or whatever that is, the ticket thing. And I never understood because there was nobody in my neighborhood that ever paid any attention to that. So why would they even have it on the news? You see what I'm saying? Very interesting. That's my first sort of consciousness, but unconscious, conscious unconsciousness. And then uh, when I got, um, and then... When I get, I guess when I yeah back there in the, in the late seventies in, in uh, 
Yeah, late seventies. I was into NPR a lot. Uh, into the eighties and all the way into the nineties, and uh, uh, listening to NPR sporadically in the nineties, but mostly in the eighties. It was, you know, it was yeah, it was, NPR was in the thing. And um, what I noticed about then, there was always there was there was a lot of there were programs on the stock market and, and being uh, being ethical stock, whatever. And what I noticed then, uh, what I came to mind then was that. And the same thing that Vet Cornell had said one time, uh, uh, Breaking Brown, you know, uh, um, uh, for her, 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 her cast, which was uh, basically uh, the stock market. You have to have discretionary funds. You have to have money that you don't need to play the stock market. And I knew that back then because, well, I'm not materialistic, remember. Um, so, so, so I understood all that, you know what I mean? But I just I didn't understand why they kept, they kept on trying to recruit people. You know, it was almost like they were trying to recruit people to be a part of this stock market. It's part of the game, part of the, gamb- part of the gambling casino. Anyway, right around that time also, I guess I should uh, 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 mention that uh, I read a, a book by uh, Melvin Van Peebles. Well, people, I like Melvin. You know, I saw all his plays on Broadway. I saw, I saw all his plays. He's supposed to die natural death and then all this stuff. Um, and uh, when he he wrote a book because he did the stock market for a bit, and he did the thing called puts puts and something else. And I read I read the book, you know, because eh, eh, I read, you know, I like no, it was entertaining, and about how you basically make money on the stock market. Okay, a little bit of money because it was all this projection. It was kind of really interesting, but then later later on, maybe ten years later, something like that, I read a novel, uh, uh, this, uh, about an American, of course, white. People. Uh, in Japan, and they was playing uh, this whole money scheme kind of thing, stock market like that. And this was, and this, uh, man, how can I say? It? You could see it was a, it, it was basically this novel showing the scam. It, it was really, really, really a, a big scam, you know. So, uh, but what really got me, what I would, as far as stock market banking, also banking is in there. Um, when I lost faith in America, if I ever had faith in America. Was during the SNL scandal, I said '84, whenever the SNL scandal was, right? Uh, 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 Pop Bush's people, you know, the, the Keating guy, you know, uh, you know, the same Keating that prosecuted the, the Hustler guy, you know, the Hustler magazine guy. Well, that Keating, uh, anyway, his law part. Anyway, this whole thing in Texas, where they basically ripped off the bank, the the the, the depositors for SNLs, you know, and it, and I think some people even went to jail for that. But the tax paper, the pet taxpayers ended up bailing. Well, something there was involved in. Okay, now I bring all this up. So that's sort of, that's sort of my understanding of what uh, of, you know, of the finances and stuff like that. And I would never play the stock market now because I'm not materialistic, but also just because basically uh, I just don't have faith in these kind of systems. And this money stuff takes faith. Uh, so basically, from 2003. Up when I first came to Africa to, to now, I haven't been really paying attention to a lot of stuff that happens, you know, on the stock market or anything like that. For the simple reason, well, I'm in Africa, I, I you know, I just don't get that kind of news, you know, I'm not paying attention to that kind of news. Um, but obviously, in that time period, you had that, that the whole collapse, the uh, 2008 collapse of the whole, um, what do you call it, the, um, the housing bubble and all the rest of that stuff. That happened, a bunch of other stuff happened. But what I'd really noticed. And when I started paying attention, is that the law that uh, that they broke in '84 with the SNL scandal? That was a law they got changed. They, meaning the money people, you know, the politicians and the money people, they got that law changed. So about when 2008 hit, when they were doing that stuff, it wasn't against the law. When as just 10 years earlier, it was against the law. Think about that. Okay, so now that brings up to oh, all also in the '80s, '90s. Because it would be, yeah, I better close this door because they make a, uh, I'll leave it alone. Um, that time period, I was at WBAI, well, I was at WBAI, and uh, they had a program called Left, the Left Business Observer uh, with Doug Henwood. So a lot of my financial stuff, you know, I'm thinking about, about you know, Doug Henwood. In fact, Doug told me something once very interesting. He said, um, look, you want to know how what, what the uh, financial state is, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. He says, open your wallet, look in your wallet, that's what it is. Because your financial state is up to what, what, what's happening to you, not just what's happening around. But basically, if you just look at your, what you, what you, that's your, that's what it is, you know, whatever you have in your bank account, in your wallet, whatever. Okay, so then, so I was in South Africa, but then I came to Alice, where I'm living now in 
Eastern Cape, Southern Africa. And uh, because the circum- I, let me go back. I don't have, I never had TV since long time, since, seven, I don't know. I don't want to when I stopped watching TV. They never owned a TV. But when I got here, I had rented out a house that had, it was a, a, a somewhat of a guest house that had TVs in every room. So I started watching TV. Actually, I was started watching RT. I get you know, Russian t- TV. You can get here. In fact, that's an interesting thing, too. I guess unless you special order it in the States, you don't get RT. You don't get RT, Russian TV. You don't get it, which is kind of strange because so you're, the media in, uh, in the States is woefully just just don't know anything because you keep on listening to the same sources reporting on the same things. Anyway. So part of Russian TV, they had a guy, uh, this guy, Max Kaiser, called, well, program called Kaiser Report. So it's Max Kaiser, his wife, Stacey Herbert. I started looking at it, not because, it, because Max, it's like me and Max are kindred spirits, not financially, that, that boy's rich. But, but I'm talking about, like, he has this thing with, where um, so, he has this sarcasm, but also this thing is absurd, just absurdity. It's, it's, it's like it's like listening to Mark Twain. You know what I mean? It's like this thing is so absurd. Do you believe this is they really going for this stuff? That's what I was getting out of Max. Plus, he lived, he, the program is like a half hour, in two, you know, two parts. First part is Max going off doing headlines with his wife. Second part is basically he has a guest, so he's a little bit more you know refined in the second part. But the first part, something goes crazy, but plucky the chicken over and stuff. Anyway, so well, I say yeah. Um, so what I so so what I got from Max and Stacy was very interesting. That's when I, but and what I got really got from them is um, this whole thing about uh, how we say. Uh, but now they they deal with the absurdity of, of things, but also you can see the crimes. You know what I mean? You you can see. Here's what I learned learned from them. This whole this is where the Bloom, Bloom, Bloomberg thing uh, uh, really comes. No, it comes together, uh, Bloomberg money kind of thing. What happens is the money system, as we know it, was gutted and it's changed or whatever have you. The money that, that that you see now is fake money. It's basically just fake money. So they're playing with fake money. So they could, and, and then it's, it's just not real. It's, it's, it, I believe me, it's just not real. And so what happens is the money that Bloomberg and them have, right, it's, it was fake to begin with, and they parlayed it in some other fake stuff so basically, they're not even using their own money anymore. They're using the taxpayers' money. They're using other people's money, right? And making money off those off of those things. The, the biggest scam. This is where electoral politics is coming to. Um, you have to understand in the electoral politics. That's how they. That's how you make the money. You make a lot of money. So you say somebody like Bloomberg. Okay. So now what does what, what, Bloomberg is paying all these people? But he's paying these people. Uh, let, let's put it this way. He's paying these people through his companies, which he's making money paying these people. You, you get what I mean? So the same thing, if you're going to advertise something on Bloomberg TV, well, you're paying your, you, you're taking your, uh, your your campaign, your own money, right? Putting it into Bloomberg, paying Bloomberg TV, who's doing whatever it's doing, you're getting all kinds of breaks. You, you understand? It's weird. You're making money off of money. So his whole Bloomberg thing, he's not, it's not costing him any money to keep his name out there and to do all this stuff, and whatever it is. So this is fantastic. This is, I mean, fantastic. It's fast, fascinating to me how people are going for this stuff. Well, let me go back to Bloomberg's money. I'm almost finished. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, Bloomberg's money. That's it. So this whole electoral politician thing, you're being duped. We're being duped. Um, uh, but you know, but it's all coming to, you could, it's all being exposed. The only thing that's going to happen, hopefully this is what will happen, there, there'll be more people than billionaires putting billions of money into into a campaign. They, they, they think this is really where you come with that thing, you know, you know, power to the people, people power. People power is going to perhaps change this whole thing. And the good thing, especially with something like, uh, let me just put speak AWS for a second. For example, ADOS is successful. What they do, this opens up things for them. You see? This little, oh, well, it opens up things so we can fight on another level. That's a little message from me. T, from the Patterson's taking the train to bed, letting you know what I only suspect. Here in Africa, going to America soon.